So tonight, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce our, our guest speaker. Uh, Rianne Booker is a nurse practitioner who spent uh, the last several years at uh, both the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton as well as here at the Tom Baker Cancer Center and is now venturing off into a provincial program in sexual health, in, uh, particularly with uh, cancer patients. Um, she's got, uh, sh I've heard her speak in the past, she does a wonderful job in presenting uh, ideas, skill sets and, and just being able to make f people feel comfortable about the topic and so that hopefully they can go forward and, and um, make their lives a little bit more fulfilling and, and uh, comfortable with their partners. So um, without, any, without any more ado, I, I would like to um, Please welcome uh, Rianne Booker, our tonight's speaker. Thank you, uh, Stuart, for the invitation to speak, and thank you, Steve, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming this evening. If I am talking too quietly or too fast, or um, if I say something that's incomprehensible, then please just raise your hand or throw something at me, and I'll slow down or um, answer any questions. I'm hoping that um, we'll have a chance at the end of this either for um, a formal question and answer period or informal, even if you want to just come up to me and ask questions, I'm happy to stay afterwards. Um, I just wanted to start by saying I've got no relevant financial uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. I do want to say that this presentation is probably fairly heterosexist in its approach and that's not by any um, uh, purposeful or an intentional reasons, but just to say that the research right now that's out there has tended to focus mostly on heterosexual couples um, and people in heterosexual relationships um, after cancer diagnoses. So we're getting better at that. There are some studies coming um, that look at um, the experience of sexuality in um, um, partners um, um, that are not involved in a heterosexual relationship. Um, but to date, right now, there's just very limited in, uh, information and uh, literature. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention as well, and I, as Stuart already mentioned this, is that I'm not here to provide medical advice and the content in this presentation is not um, intended to, to provide any kind of medical advice or, or anything like that. So any questions that you may have um, regarding what I present, I ask you to please discuss with your healthcare providers um, and hopefully it will at least give you some food for thought and, uh, and get uh, some questions um, established. Um, and I'm going to get rolling here. So. Uh, the objectives this evening, I'd like to first talk about um, what sexuality is, what sexual function is, and what the common sexual dysfunctions are after prostate cancer. Um, and then I want to talk about some of the ways that altered sexuality and sexual function can be managed. And then I'm going to randomly pick people from the audience and ask you questions, just kidding. And uh, then I'll stick around and answer any questions that you may have, um, or perhaps we can do a, a formal question and answer period. Um, cancer and sexuality is very, very complex. Cancer, uh, or sorry, sexuality in and of itself is, is very complex. It's a broad comp um, concept, excuse me, encompassing aspects of self-image, body image, patterns of affection, social, family, gender roles, and physical and emotional intimacy. There are a number of factors that influence sexuality, and some of those factors may precede a cancer diagnosis. They may arise upon being di diagnosed with cancer, or they may emerge with treatment. Sometimes some of the issues don't arise or are not really recognized until the treatment phase is finished and you're in what we call the survivorship phase. Um, adequate sexual function relies on intact nervous or nerve, vascular or blood flow, and endocrine or hormone system function. So we know with prostate cancer we muck around with that quite a bit. Um, in addition, there are a number of comorbid medical conditions that may also impact sexual function and sexuality. Anything that's going to affect nerve, blood, or hormone function, so things like thyroid dysfunction, diabetes, um, cardiovascular, or peripheral vascular disease, and the medications we use to treat those conditions can also all affect uh, sexual function and sexuality. The sexual response cycle, this was first described by Masters and Johnson in uh, the mid-60s. And the original depiction or the original thought was that uh, it was somewhat of a linear response. So it started with desire and then was followed by excitement or arousal and then there was a plateau phase and that was followed by orgasm. Um, it's a great model in the sense that it, it kind of provides um, uh, information about the physiologic changes that happen during sexual stimulation. 
But we now know that it's not quite as simple as being linear, and particularly for women, although I think it's unfair to say that it's necessarily that different for, for women and men. I think sometimes for women it can be a bit more different, and we spoke about this earlier in the women's and caregivers group, is that sometimes women may not always follow the same uh, linear approach in that um, a woman might come home from work and see that her husband's picked up his socks and think, man, he's looking sexy, and all of a sudden she is interested. Um, and for men it can be a bit different. Men often, um, we think of it in terms of starting with desire and libido, being followed by arousal or erection, and then the plateau phase and orgasm. Um, although I think we're learning that it's not always as simple as that as well. And I think for men and women, it's more of a, a cycle or more of a complex um, um, approach than it was uh, sorry, initially um, depicted by this linear model. I think it's important to realize as well that this um, is a cycle and that one phase can influence the, um, the other phase. So if you have a painful experience with sexual intercourse, that may then in turn um, affect subsequent libido or desire. Um, if you have a difficult time achieving erection, there may be issues then with the next time you go to try and have a sexual encounter where desire or libido may be affected because of that um, experience with difficulty achieving erection before. This next slide is a bit complicated, but again, kind of speaks to um, the notion of um, sexual responses being very complex, and there can be different motivating factors, and there can be different reasons or different things that can influence someone's um, interest and, and libido and desire and that kind of thing. So again, just keeping in mind that it's complex. But the good thing about that is that um, because it's complex, it gives us numerous opportunities to intervene and make things better. Um, and help if there are issues that arise. Sexual dysfunction and cancer, we know in the cancer population it's estimated that sexual dysfunction affects between 40 and 100 percent of patients. Um, I think historically we think of, pr of prostate or some of the genital urinary um, malignancies um, such as prostate, testicular, bladder, those kinds of cancers as um, having an impact on sexual function but really Believe me when I tell you that this affects many, many individuals irrespective of the cancer diagnosis. My background had been predominantly in hematology and bone marrow transplant. It was a major issue in that group as well. Um, so I think the diagnosis of cancer and the, the various treatments can all have a huge, huge impact on sexual function. Again, across the lifespan, we know that as we age, both men and women experience changes in hormone function. That can have an adverse effect on sexual function. Um, the other medical conditions that can arise as we get older can also affect sexual function. But there are some nuances that are unique to the ages across the lifespan. So for young adults or mid-adulthood, um, that might be a time when people are forging new relationships. They may be thinking about fertility and that kind of thing. Mid-adulthood, people may have already had their children. Fertility might not be an issue as much. They may be more secure in their relationship. I think it's a myth to assume that just because you're in a long-term stable relationship that it's easier for you than for somebody who's just starting out. If you're not talking, that can be a huge change and that can have a huge negative impact on the relationship. Um, Many adults continue to experience very active and satisfying sex lives well into the seventh and eighth decade of life and beyond. Um, we do know that the levels of sex hormones start to decline in the 40s and 50s. So we know that sexual function can start to change for men and women in their 40s and 50s. But there are things we can do about that for sure. I think it's important to also realize that not everybody is thinking about sex as soon as they hear the diagnosis of cancer. You have prostate cancer. How's your sex life is not the first thing that comes to mind necessarily. However, there are some important things to think about <laughs> at the time of diagnosis, particularly if you're concerned about preserving or maintaining fertility. During treatment, again, it really depends on the kind of treatment you're receiving um, and the importance of sex in your lives. And I'm talking here about sexual activity specifically. A lot of people, again, say, are you kidding? I wouldn't want to have sex when I'm, you know, having uh, diarrhea or puking or, you know, all of these different things. But for other people, even when they're actively being treated on inpatient oncology units, it's still an important time for them to maintain some kind of uh, physical intimacy. So it really is individual and specific to the individual going through the treatment and his or her partner. Um, Again, there are some things that may be pertinent when you're thinking about treatment. Should you be using condoms while you're receiving chemo, for example, or receiving um, uh, radiation therapy? Uh, there are some important questions we'll get to towards the end of the presentation that I think are relevant during the treatment phase. 
I think where we hear about this most often or think about this most often was in the recovery and survivorship phase when people have finished their treatment and they're trying to get back to their normal lives. And I think this is where um, a lot of people will start to, to wonder, you know, now I'm all done my treatment, what about my sex life? You know, things have kind of been put on hold for a while, I want to get back to where things were. And believe it or not, I think that um, it also is very, very important during advanced disease. And again, depending on what your definition of, se of sexual activity is, um, this is a time during advanced di disease or um, um, uh, end of life care where people require physical intimacy of some kind. It may not be sexual intercourse, but it may be a physical closeness such as laying in bed together, holding each other, holding hands, that kind of thing. But we don't make double beds in hospitals. We don't have ways to support that physical intimacy as end of life um, approaches in the hospital setting. We can certainly work on other ways though, in other contexts to make that happen. There was a, a study done here in Calgary a decade or so ago by one of the palliative care doctors who looked at um, sexual uh, sexuality in, in palliative care patients and, and most of the participants said that it was still important to maintain a physical and emotional close, closeness with their partner. So I think we do need to do a little better job uh, addressing this as healthcare professionals for sure. Um, specific to pros prostate cancer. I'm starting to talk fast, sorry. Um, specific to prostate cancer and sexuality, I want to first talk about normal male sexual function and then discuss some changes that may arise after prostate cancer uh, diagnosis and treatment. So there's a lot of different things that may be affected um, by a prostate cancer diagnosis uh, and the subsequent treatment. So libido or interest, that, that sexual response cycle again, libido or interest, arousal, in particular we think about erectile function, um, ejaculation can change, orgasm can change, intercourse can become uncomfortable for various reasons. Uh, we know there, there can be altered hormone function. Um, there can be specific other um, treatment um, or disease manifestations and, and testicular GVH is related to um, a side effect or a complication of bone marrow transplant, so not pertinent to prostate cancer. Um, but certainly surgery affecting the male sex organs, changes in fertility. And for men, I think we overlook this sometimes or don't give this enough emphasis. Body image, self-esteem, um, and um, self-worth can be hugely affected by cancer diagnosis and treatment. There was this cartoon circulated around the internet a couple, a couple years ago, and it, it, saying that you know for man it's a button, yes, no, a, a switch you know you have off on, and a woman is a lot more complicated. And I think it, it's funny, but I think we do need to, you know, to, to say it definitely, definitely can be a lot more complex for males too. We need to give them, sometimes we need to give them more credit. Um, so male sex, sexual function. In men, the testicles produce um, hormones, in particular testosterone. Um, a small amount of testosterone is produced by the adrenal glands as well, but the, it's the testicles that make the bulk of the testosterone. And after the sperm mature in the testicles, they're taken uh, via the vas deferens, a, a long tube, uh, from the epididymis um, towards, sorry, the epididymis is the tube. Um, they go uh, from the epididymis toward the prostate gland, and at the prostate gland, the sperm mix with fluids from the prostate and the seminal vesicles. During orgasm, the mixture of the fluid and sperm, which combined to form semen, move through the urethra and out of the penis. Um, so testosterone is really important in, in this um, uh, context when we talk about prostate cancer. Um, erectile function, we know that the penis contains two cylindrical sponge-like structures called the corpus cavernosum. And erection begins when the brain sends a signal down the spinal cord and through the nerves that run down into the penis. It's really important here because some of the important nerves that are required to have an erection um, run along both sides of the prostate gland. When the signal is received, the spongy tissue inside the shaft of the penis relaxes and the arteries that carry blood into the penis expand. The blood fills up two, the two spongy tubes of tissue and that causes um, the erection. There are veins in the penis which normally drain blood out of the penis and they squeeze shut so that more blood stays in the penis and can't drain back out. The nerves that allow a man to feel um, pleasure during sexual activity, however, run in a different path than the nerves that control blood flow. So even if nerve damage or blocked vessels cause erectile dysfunction, a man can still often feel pleasure and still reach orgasm. So yes, you can have an erection, or you can have an orgasm without an erection, and a lot of men don't know that. Um, with orgasm in particular, there are two stages. Um, so emission, uh, and that's when the prostate 
seminal vesicles and vast deferens contract, semen's deposited at the top of the urethra, and then a small valve at the top there um, closes to keep semen from going upward into the bladder. Ejaculation is the second stage of orgasm and is controlled by the same nerves that carry the pleasure signals um, when the genital area is caressed. The nerves cause a muscle around the base of the penis to squeeze in rhythm, pushing semen out through, through the urethra and out of the penis, and pleasure signals are sent to the brain. So the pelvic floor muscles are important in, in that component or that area as well. We know that damage to the nerves or blood vessels can er affect erectile function, and we know that there is a component of psychologic or um, mental um, um, capacity as well, not capacity, but mental effect as well um, that can affect erectile function. Um, specific to prostate cancer, so radical prostatectomy, um, where the prostate cancer or the prostate gland is removed, the seminal vesicles are also removed. So you're not going to have the fluid that you would normally have. Um, and for some men, that can change the sensation. So A, you're going to have what's called a, a dry ejaculate, a dry ejaculate or no ejaculate, um, a dry orgasm. And for some men, they say that that lack of fluid buildup in the urethra, you lose that sense of fullness and that sense of inevitability that uh, orgasm is about to happen. Some men say that dry orgasm is, uh, really feels no different than um, what they would call their previous normal um, orgasm. And some men say that orgasm is less intense. Some men say it's more intense. So it really depends uh, on the person. Um, after surgery, it can take up to two years for erectile function to return. And it's really important to consider what the, the pre-erectile um, function was. Uh, the age of the man is also important. Um, what their erections were like before surgery are also important as well. Another complication that's not talked about often is penile shortening. The nerve sparing surgery that uh, most uh, urologists are, are favoring these days um, seems to have uh, a protective effect on um, penile length loss at one year post prostatectomy and also recovery of erectile function seems to pre preserve penile length as well. I'll talk a little bit about um, sexual rehabil rehabilitation or penile rehabilitation, but the goal of that is really to keep the tissues of the penis healthy and prevent tissue changes. So they're actually saying it's really good to have erections within weeks of surgery, not necessarily sex, but to have erections. Um, radiation, we know this really depends on the area being treated and how much was given. Uh, of course, we know that the combination of surgery and radiation together can make things worse. Um, um, radiation can cause erectile dysfunction by affecting the blood vessels again, um, decreasing their, the stretchability of the blood vessels, causing scar tissue. Um, radiation can also damage nerves in the area um, and, and prevent erection, um, erectile function from, from occurring as well. We know that radiation um, in the pelvic area can affect testosterone production in the testicles. Um, we see some men have severe skin changes, almost like a sunburn. Um, for some men, after radiation, they can have pain when they ejaculate, and that's because, because the epididymis, that tube that carries semen, um, can become inflamed and irritated. That typically is a, a temporary uh, experience for most men, that pain with ejaculation um, usually goes away. Um, and changes in sensation of the treated area, so mu some men will feel some numbness or loss of sensation in the areas being treated. And like um, a lot of our cancer treatments, radiation can cause other side effects like hair loss, um, diarrhea, fatigue, and that kind of thing. About 25 to 30% of men who get radiation notice that their erections actually get worse over the first year. So that's important to keep in mind as well, to not be discouraged that things are getting worse um, during that first year. We know that can happen. And as you get further out from that first year, things may actually improve. Chemotherapy can cause altered fertility, changes in hormone production, nerve damage, um, other side effects as well. So if you're feeling really nauseated or having diarrhea, um, that doesn't necessarily uh, confer a very sexy status or make you that interested necessarily in, in having sex. Um, but there are things that we can do to treat the side effects associated with chemo. Um, nerve damage is one that can be persistent, um, but does improve with time after chemo is completed. So male sexual function and endocrine therapy or androgen deprivation therapy. I know that Lauren Walker and John Robinson will be speaking to this group sometime in the coming months, next month. Um, so again, we know with um, some types of breast cancer that grow in the presence of estrogen and progesterone, 
We know that some types of prostate cancer, and, and for a long time it was thought that any amount of testosterone was a bad thing when we talk about prostate cancer um, cells. But we know that testosterone can, can also, or can definitely cause um, prostate cancer cells to grow. So the theory behind androgen deprivation therapy is if we deprive the cancer cells of testosterone, then they won't grow. And so this is a mainstay of, of treatment, especially for metastatic or advanced prostate cancer. Um, one way to remove testosterone production in the body is to remove the, the, the testicles because that's where uh, t the majority of testosterone is produced. Um, we can also use medications to either stop testosterone from being made or block it from actually exerting its effect at the tissues. Um, you can have continuous androgen deprivation therapy or intermittent androgen deprivation therapy and the latter is is gaining more favor um, in recent years and I'm sure that Lauren and John will speak to that when they when they um, present to you next month but to say for sure that if we know that testosterone is a driving force in desire and libido and is also important in maintaining erections if we take testosterone away, we're likely to cause some changes in libido interest and uh, erectile function. Changes in ejaculation. Um, so again, if we take out, out the prostate and the seminal vesicles, there will be no, no semen. So that's a dry orgasm. There will be no ejaculate. Um, the sperm cells will continue to be made, but they'll just be simply reabsorbed by the body. If someone undergoes uh, a transurethral prostatectomy, uh, or TERP, um, that, I didn't bring a pointer, I, I said I didn't need one, Stuart, sorry. Um, there's a little valve at the top of the urethra, so there they're doing the TERP going up through the urethra, this is the prostate gland right here, and there's a little valve at the top, so if they do a TERP, often that little valve at the top is damaged and you can end up with urine leakage during ejaculation, or what's called climacteria. Um, and, and that can be an embarrassing issue for some people. Um, and so one way to mitigate that or to deal with that is to wear condoms, which not everyone is necessarily fond of, or to use an erection or a constriction ring um, at the base of the penis, and that can help um, with the urine leak leakage. Again, as I mentioned, um, some men can have pain with ejaculation. From what I've seen, what I've heard from my urology colleagues, this tends to be a little bit more short-lived of, of a side effect, thankfully. As you can imagine, if there was continued pain with ejaculation, nobody would want to ejaculate. Um, but that can often be a, a temporary side effect of radiation, so that um, the epididymis is irritated temporarily from radiation. If a man has just radiation or hormone therapy, but no prostatectomy, um, he may still produce semen, but may notice that it's, it's reduced in volume. Erectile function, we hear a fair amount about this with prostate cancer treatments, but I want to tell you that it's actually quite common in the general population as well. So more than 50% of men who are older than 40 have some degree of erectile dysfunction. Um, and we know that any condition or medication that affects nerve function or blood flow or hormone function can affect erectile function as well. Um, so it's fairly common um, and we can see uh, with men, it may not be a complete absence or lack of erectile function, but it may just be that there's difficulty achieving erections, difficulty maintaining them, or maybe they're just not as firm as they used to be. But as I mentioned already, um, the mechanisms behind the erectile dysfunction tend to be related to nerve dysfunction or blood vessel dysfunction, so that can be veins or arteries, it can be changes in hormone function, it can be psychogenic or psychologic, and in many cases, it's a combination of some or all of the above. Um, again, if there's a bunch of different potential reasons here for the erectile dysfunction, it gives us an opportunity to intervene as well in, in different ways. So that, to me, that says if something doesn't work, there may be something else that might work because it may be one of these reasons um, that's contributing. Fertility, again, as I mentioned, this may or may not be an issue for all patients, but it's something that's really important um, to discuss up front before treatment starts. Um, the, the various treatments we employ for treating cancer can, be, uh, can leave somebody permanently infertile, um, or it, it could be temporary, um, but it's something that we do want to talk about before treatment starts because there is a risk of, of permanent infertility. This is another area that doesn't get as much research as I think it should, is what's the impact of cancer and subsequent treatment on partners? Um, we talked about this in the group um, before this session started. 
And it's very common, the research, research has shown already, that some partners may feel fearful of causing pain or discomfort during sexual activity. They may interpret the um, lack of sexual activity as perhaps their partner's way of, of um, being not attracted to them anymore. They may perceive it as, as them not being wanted anymore. Um, they also may find it difficult to change from being the partner to being the caregiver. So if, if um, particularly with advanced disease, if you're suddenly doing all the caregiving for somebody and the roles reverse, it can be difficult to look at them the same way. Um, so we see this uh, from time to time. We also see that um, uh, partners may really be worried about bringing this up with their, with their um, partner because um, they feel one study used the words that they, they wanted to push their own needs aside. They had to worry about their partner while he or she was going through treatment and they just had to push their needs aside. Both parties tend to wait for the other one to talk about the, or to initiate talking about this. So it ends up that neither talks about it and the couple ends up um, suffering in silence, unfortunately. There was a study just published in January uh, of this year, and it was a Swiss study, and they looked at both female and male sexual functioning after prostatectomy, and they looked at nerve sparing, bilateral, unilateral. They also looked at robotic um, assisted prostatectomy. And they found that as the male sexual function declined, so did the woman's, the female sexual function declined. They were congruently declining. And they actually found that um, the longer the women went without having sexual activity, the worse their sexual function ended up being months down the road as well. And we know that um, a lot of women in this, <clears throat> in, in the particular age group where um, some men are diagnosed with prostate cancer, if women are in their 50, late 50s and 60s, they may be experiencing menopause. And a postmenopausal, I know this is about the men, but I'm going to talk about the vagina for just one second. A postmenopausal vagina um, can be experiencing lots of changes. And we, we call some of that. Um, uh, there's a new term that was just coined late last year called the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And we see vulvovaginal or, or vaginal and vulvar um, changes um, with estrogen declining, we see becoming very dry, and that can lead to very painful intercourse. And the longer a period of time elapses with no intercourse, the more painful it can be when the woman and the man go back to, to um, engaging in, uh, or the woman and her partner, I should say, um, go back to in trying to engage in sexual activity. Um, so there are things, women, we can do for you as well, and the women upstairs that were in the previous session know that I passed around some uh, different vibrators and some different lubricants and things like that. Um, and they're here for you men to look at too. Um, <laughs> and play with. But it's important that when we're fixing the problem in one partner, that we're talking to the other partner to figure out what his or her needs are so that we're making sure there's not a mismatch. If I can fix the erectile dysfunction in a man, but the woman's going through severe changes secondary to menopause, I've not helped that couple. I've got to help them together to figure out what is going to be um, best for the two of them together. And again, as I said, we need more, more research on the effects of treatment and uh, cancer on, uh, in the context of gay, transgendered, bisexual, um, and um, lesbian, and, and men who have um, sex with men uh, relationships. We don't have a lot of information about that right now. So what can we do about all of this? The big, 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 big thing is to start, uh, somebody in the women's session mentioned this first, be self-aware. First of all, we need to be comfortable with our own sexuality. What, what are our thoughts about this? What are our feelings about this? And then we need to talk about it. And the first person to talk to is your partner. Um, find out what, what your partner, um, what his or her thoughts are about sexual function, what your goals are together as a couple, what your partner's goals are, and see if you can reach some kind of, of um, agreeable point. Being aware that things may change, so sexual positions may have to change. Sexual intercourse may not be the be-all, end-all goal anymore. It may be different kinds of sexual activity. I think the, the point I want to hammer home today, though, is that physical intimacy and, and um, emotional intimacy can always be preserved, and um, sexual function may change, and it may not look the same as it did before cancer diagnosis, but we can still find ways to preserve, um, uh, preserve some degree of, of physical and emotional intimacy and some quality of life in the relationship. I think psychology and counseling are always important. Um, pardon me. 
in, in some circumstances, I do think medications and medical devices um, are required, and I think it's important to involve the appropriate specialties when, when required as well. Communication, talking with your partner about your feelings. Um, this can be difficult if you've never done this before, and especially if you've been together for a long time and all of a sudden this is something new that you've got to do. Be concerned and empathetic about how your partner feels. Um, sometimes just showing that empathy can go a long way and make that um, open the door and make your partner feel comfortable and less vulnerable when talking about these things. Planning ahead sometimes, I know that there um, is, is something to be said for the lack of spontaneity when you've got to plan ahead and that can be in some ways um, possibly I guess um, unsexy um, but can also alleviate a lot of the issues that arise. Um, taking it slow and being patient but being persistent as well. If something's not working, keep trying or try something different. Um, and, and I think it's important to also acknowledge the loss of sexual function. You can grieve it, it it's a loss, and, and recognize that grief may be part of that loss. Change the goal of sexual activity, as I said, and try to be sexual even when spontaneous desire is lacking. Um, that's difficult, everyone's busy, people can be tired, there can be side effects. Um, it may not be at the top of your mind or at the top of the menu, but sometimes trying to be um, um, sexual even when that desire isn't there. Again, back to that complicated cycle, once you start and get involved in the sexual activity, then interest may come, arousal may come. So um, I think just being persistent with that can really go a long way. Um, Lauren and John will probably speak to this next month, but um, this uh, was uh, an article that they recently published. These are some sample questions. So if you've never had these discussions um, before with your partner, here's an example. So the patient might want to ask the partner, what should we do when you get aroused and I don't? Is it okay if I bring you to orgasm through touching or oral caressing even though I no longer have full erections? How do you feel about me using or exploring ED treatments and or sex toys? Um, the partner may want to ask the patient, do you still enjoy me touching you even though you don't get fully sexually aroused? What kinds of touching do you most enjoy now? If there's pain because of scarring, if there's pain because of radiation, maybe the person doesn't want to be touched in the same way anymore because it's uncomfortable or hurts or feels strange. Again, asking each other, are you comfortable with one of us reaching orgasm even if the other doesn't? How do you feel about us touching, caressing, cuddling without either one reaching orgasm? And what about the sex toys um, or other medical devices and that kind of thing? Intimacy, again, there's different specific activities you can do and, and non-intercourse activities um, can be really interesting and, and sensate focus is a, is a very specialized um, activity. And again, the psychologist um, at Tom Baker would be familiar with, with this technique. And, and the goal is not to have sexual intercourse. In fact, you wait weeks and weeks and weeks and you're only allowed to do certain types of touching in the, as the um, exercise progresses. So it can be quite exciting for both partners and you can learn and, and communicate about what feels good and what doesn't and um, particularly if there's an area that has caused some grief with scarring or, or that kind of thing in the past. Body image, I think there are lots of changes that may arise uh, after a cancer diagnosis. There can be skin changes, swelling, there can be uh, changes with physical um, skills and athletic capabilities and that kind of thing, um, scars and, and hair loss. Um, I think this, this cartoon says, it's done wonders for my self-esteem. Um, the little shark, or the little fish looks like a shark. But I think it's really important to, to talk to your partner about, about issues with self-esteem and talk to your cancer care team as well. Because we have various different resources that we are able to access that can help you with changes in body image. And again, I know a lot of the emphasis goes to the women who are facing cancer, um, but I think this is equally as important for men as well. Managing symptoms is really important. Planning your day. so. You know, in North America culture, sex tends to happen in the evenings. It tends to happen at the end of a long week on a Friday evening, maybe. Um, that's when people are often at their their um, their worst in terms of fatigue. So plan your day. Take take short naps or breaks if you need to. Um, think about when you might have the most energy in your day. That may mean that you become a morning sex person now. Um, and in fact, that's when testosterone happens to peak. So uh, a lot of people do um, advise having sex in the morning anyway. But I think um, some of this is just rethinking what, what used to work and, and it's adjusting to the new normal. 
The specific medical interventions, I have been very lucky to have sought out um, the specialists in the city who focus on sexual health and and so referring to urology, endocrinology, the hormone doctors, psychology, I think that's always something to consider. Penile re rehabilitation I'll talk about in a second here. Pelvic floor physiotherapy, so we talk about this um, often for women, particularly after childbirth, but pelvic floor physiotherapy can do wonders for men as well after prostate cancer treatment. Um, and there are great pelvic floor physiotherapists in the city. Some of them work at the pelvic floor clinic and some of them work in private practice. And then getting into the specific reasons um, for erectile dysfunction and ways that we can uh, combat erectile dysfunction. Penile rehabilitation, I know you probably can't read this, but this, um, the whole notion behind um, penile rehabilitation is that we know even with nerve sparing techniques, prostatectomy and prostate cancer treatments do lead to erectile dysfunction. So um, one, of the, one of the key leaders in this area is John Mulhall, and he's a urologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. And he presented this a few years ago, and he actually has a book that I've brought along as well. Um, but they talk about using uh, the drugs, the medication, like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, those kinds of things. They give those preoperatively before the surgery. They give them again postoperatively fairly soon. So the intent here is not to have sex or sexual activity even necessarily, but the intent is if you're having an erection, you're, you're encouraging blood flow to the penile tissues, that's encouraging oxygenation to the penile tissues, that's keeping the penile tissues healthy, and it goes back to, they said, the whole use it or lose it. You know, if you're going to keep, keep it and keep maintaining function, it has a better chance of recovery down the road. Again, not necessarily intended for people to be having sex immediately post-operatively, um, but having the erections, preserving the oxygenation to the penile tissues. We know the, the stats for erectile dysfunction um, post-prostatectomy, anywhere between 20 and 90% um, are, are known to the prevalent, prevalence rates um, of erectile dysfunction after prostatectomy. That depends on various different things, what the function was before surgery, um, if nerve sparing techniques were employed, um, and other, medic uh, other um, uh, medical conditions that may be contributing, that kind of thing. Um, but we know that it still exists, so penile re rehabilitation is being uh, encouraged by some centers and some surgeons. Um, the drugs that we've seen the commercials for, so we have in Canada now we have four that we can, we can uh, prescribe for patients. Um, they cause smooth muscle relaxation of the penis and, and they cause um, uh, a relaxation of the, of the vessels to allow filling with blood. So if there's a, a major nerve damage or if there's um, a major issue um, uh, that's not related to blood flow, sometimes these drugs don't work. Um, they have class-related side effects. Some people complain of headaches, facial flushing, um, that kind of thing. Most of those tend to be self-limiting and tend to resolve fairly quickly. Um, these drugs are not to be used at the same time as nitroglycerin um, because it, it, used concurrently or used together, they can cause a huge, severe drop in blood pressure. Um, but they can be used with other medications. Again, it's important just to, to ask your doctor before you take this. Um, we now have a five milligram um, daily dose uh, that we can uh, prescribe of Cialis and that has allowed some men to have more spontaneity because of one of the problems with these drugs is you need to take it, um, take them 30 to 60 minutes before sexual activity. So that takes away a little of the spontaneity. So the five milligram daily dosing of Cialis, you know, somebody could take that medication with their blood pressure medications every day and have a little bit more spontaneity. Um, there is also Staxin, which is an orally disintegrating tablet. That's one, it's very similar to Vardenafil or Levitra. And in the US now, they've got a drug called Avanafil um, that's got a very short half-life. So uh, you've seen the Cialis commercials. It's, it's kind of nicknamed the Weekender, Tadalafil um, Cialis. Its half-life is 17 and a half hours. That doesn't mean that you walk around in the upright position for 17 and a half hours, <laughs> but it does mean that um, if you were to take the drug, you have a bigger window then that you can participate in sexual activity, whereas with some of the other drugs, Viagra, Sildenafil, three to five hour half-life, if you take it, fall asleep, and wake up in the morning, it probably won't work as well as if you took the other one. The benefit with Avanafil, you might wonder, it's got less than an hour and a half of a half-life, it's very short. But the benefit is, if somebody was taking nitroglycerin, 
then it wouldn't be dangerous to take those two within several hours of each other. Um, still not recommended, but it wouldn't have the same danger as one that lasts in your blood for that much longer. Um, other options for erectile dysfunction. Um, intercavernosal injection therapy. I know a lot of men get squeamish about this because it's the picture at the top. It's injecting, um, it's injecting either one of those PD5 inhibitor drugs um, or a prostaglandin into the penis. Um, it's really effective. So in some types of nerve damage where those drugs don't work, um, injecting into, it's usually the side of the penis. And believe it or not, men are usually taught to do this themselves. Um, uh, the first dose is usually given in the urologist or physician's yeah. office and then they're taught to do this themselves and it can be very effective. So 85 to 90 per, per, percent um, efficacy and particularly for people who have nerve damage kind of erectile dysfunction. So, so that wouldn't necessarily be the first line um, that we jump to um, but it can be a very, very effective um, option. Uh, Transurethral therapy as well is, is um, it's a little pellet um, they call it a suppository, which always makes people think of the other side, but it's a pellet that is inserted into the urethra, um, and it contains a prostaglandin, and um, prostaglandin can cause um, vasodilation or um, um, filling of the blood um, vessels and cause an erection to occur as well. And that one tends to be uh, efficacious in the order of 20 to 40 percent, depending again on the reason. Vacuum devices are also very, can be very effective. Um, efficacy rates of 90 to 100 percent when used correctly. Um, they do, I, I think it is worthwhile to invest in a decent vacuum erection device. Uh, you can buy some of these uh, online for very cheaply, but I think it's, it's uh, worthwhile to invest in a, in a medical grade one if you can afford it. Um, and it needs to be used usually, and the, the instructions will be there. Um, but with uh, an ere erection ring or constriction ring to keep the, the blood in the penis. Never, never, never to be used these uh, erection or constriction rings for longer than 30 minutes um, because that can cause um, lack of oxygenated blood in the penis and, and major problems. Um, the trouble with the vacuum erection devices, even though they, they work very well, is they do require a little bit of forethought. Um, they can cause some... Um, uh, penile um, bruising and they can cause um, some penile discomfort um, but they do work very effectively for many men and not also not necessarily a first line um, would be penile implantation of um, malleable semi-rigid rods or inflatable implants so um, this one has got an inflatable cylinder here. Um, they place the pump sometimes in the, uh, I believe in the pelvic area or abdomen or in the scrotum and you can pump it and uh, fill it up and that can cause an erection or they can place um, a malleable or semi-rigid rod and you can, uh, um, you can bend it to, um, to the upward position, I guess. Um, so those can also be very effective. These would be placed by urologists and this surgery, um, when last I checked with one of the urologists here in the city, this is, um, procedure would be covered by um, Alberta Health um, Insurance. Testosterone replacement after prostate cancer. I promised Stuart I wouldn't get into this, whoops, um, and I won't, I won't belabor this because the bottom line is right now this needs more research. If you're compelled and if you're interested, there is a physician uh, at Harvard who does a lot of work uh, in this area looking at prostate cancer and giving men testos testosterone replacement therapy after prostate cancer, which a lot of you in the room are probably thinking, that's counterintuitive, won't that make the prostate cancer cells grow? Yes is the short answer, we think it does, but we're learning now that it doesn't seem to be dose respons response dependent, meaning that uh, it doesn't seem like just because we increase testosterone, we're gonna increase the growth of cancer cells. The, the physician is Abraham Morgenthaler and he speaks of we know that males' testosterone peaks in their 20s, but prostate cancer doesn't peak until men are much older. The risk of prostate cancer goes up as we get older. Testosterone production goes down as we get older. But we do know that especially for advanced and metastatic disease, um, and, and, and when there is a very low testosterone environment, that prostate cancer cells are exquisitely sensitive to testosterone meaning we can give a small amount of testosterone to those particular cancer cells and cause them to grow for sure. So the short answer is, this may be something that we may see in the future, 
for some men in some circumstances, and I don't think we'll be able to say for a long time what the risk of recurrence will be for those particular men, much like we're saying right now with, with women who have um, hormone receptor positive breast cancers. We can't say that the risk is zero. There's always some risk that we might increase the risk, the chance of recurrence, but we have to balance the potential risks with the potential benefits, and I think we'll hear more about this in the future, and maybe in a, in a year or two's time, um, there can be a topic at this meeting again uh, addressing this, because I think we're going to hear more about this. Um, right now, this is not, um, it's not a recommended option um, for, for men, um, because we just don't, don't know what the risk will be. Um, herbal or natural products again to you and, and I think this is another caution that I urge you to be careful about is if you see something that's going that's purporting to improve your sex, sexual life, your sex function, be it for men, be it for women and you buy it online or you see it in the gas station, always check the ingredients. Um, well, I know <laughs> there was a, a talk at the World Meeting on Sexual Medicine in 2012 in Chicago and one of the researchers presented, they had purchased 91 samples uh, online of Viagra and they found that 81% um, actually did contain some active pharmaceutical ingredient, um, but only 38% actually contained, um, sorry it wasn't just Viagra, it was Tadalafil, Sildenafil, so Cialis or Viagra. Eight products that they tested contained both drugs. 20% were considered overpotent, so overdosing. Um, they had label inadequacies where they didn't have expiration dates on them or lot numbers. And previous analyses had showed that some of them actually contained traces of brick dust or ink toner, cart or ink toner from printer cartridges. So be careful with the things you buy. Um, be careful too because some of these products work because they contain hormone variants in them. So if it's not safe for you to take testosterone and you're taking something herbal that contains a testosterone, uh, testosterone variant of some kind, then just be really careful about it. So, um, yeah, that, that's all I'm going to say about that. The guess that I thought that was interesting. Uh, fertility options again, it's it's preferable if we do these um, interventions prior to treatment starting. Um, but if if fertility preservation is important, we usually collect semen up front. Um, and store it, and it can be used at a later date to implant, um, or to, sorry, to um, either in vitro or um, artificial insemination um, or that kind of thing. Um, this is a fairly easy process for men. Um, they can do it at, there's a diagnostic semen laboratory, laboratory here in Calgary, and men can go and they can um, provide their sample. It's often analyzed first, and then they can store it. Um, the storage costs are not inexpensive, though. They run about $400 a year. Um, there is a company in Canada called Fertile Future that can provide financial assistance to help out um, with some of these fertility preservation um, options. Um, but, but that's one option that we usually encourage men to think about before treatment starts because again, as I mentioned, sometimes these treatments can leave men uh, permanently infertile. So things to think about. It's normal for people to experience changes in sexuality following cancer treatment. Has this been an issue at all? Since your diagnosis and treatment, has your ability or interest in sexual activity changed? And does it bother you? It may have changed, but it may not be a bother. Do you see yourself differently in terms of physical appearance, how you look at relationships, and how you function as a person? Um, these are some frequently asked questions I hear um, often. How soon after treatment can I have sex? Well, it really depends on the type of treatment you're receiving. Um, so we encourage you to ask your healthcare provider doesn't make a difference which position we use. Yeah, you know, sometimes different positions can be more comfortable. Um, the Canadian Cancer Society produces a booklet called Cancer and Sexuality. It's up on the walls at the Tom Baker Cancer Centre. They have diagrams of different sexual positions, um, and, and quite a number of them actually. Um, erectile function, it really depends on the type of treatment and the reason for erectile difficulty and what the function was like beforehand. Again, um, fertility depends on various factors as well. That your age at time of treatment and, that, and your pre-treatment fertility status as well as the type of treatment you receive. Should you use condoms after chemotherapy is another question I, I hear a lot. And the short answer is yes, for a few days probably because we know that for a few days there may be traces of chemotherapy in uh, vaginal secretions or um, semen. However, there have been no adequate studies to prove that that necessarily happens. And if it does happen, what are the risks to your partner? 
Um, we don't advise people impregnating uh, partners when they're receiving chemotherapy or while they're undergoing radiation therapy. Um, and we usually recommend they wait six to 12 months uh, after treatment's finished before they do impregnate a partner or before they do consider getting pregnant if they're a female. Um, the condom thing, there, again, as I say, there's no strong evidence to say that is absolutely um, essential, but we do recommend that people use condoms for two to three days after chemotherapy. Um, having sex while you're getting treatment, the big cautions there would be if your platelets, which are your blood clotters, if they are low or if your neutrophils, which are a certain type of white blood cell and they fight infections, if those numbers are really low, theoretically you could be at risk for bleeding when your platelets are low or infection when your neutrophils are low. Again, there haven't been any huge studies to say that that is a huge risk um, in the context of sex. So we talk about this and just say, just be cautious and ask your, your physician. I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> um, who should you talk to or who can you talk to about your concerns? Uh, the number one person I'd say to start with is your partner. Um, and then after that, your healthcare providers, nurses, doctors, psychologists, social workers, pharmacists. Um, and again, I've mentioned to the group before this that we're working really hard to get a provincial health, or provincial sexual health program established for people um, and their partners um, after they've been diagnosed with cancer. So Edmonton's been successful and they've had their clinic up and running for over a year now. And we are hampered a little bit here in Calgary by space and resources, but we're pushing forward and we're hoping that we'll have a sexual health clinic at the Tom Baker Cancer Centre in the next six months um, so that people can have a place to, to bring these concerns. Um, your family doctor is another one that I, sh I should have on there, but um, your family doctor is also someone you can talk to. But as I did mention to the group before as well, Unfortunately, not a lot of healthcare providers are educated necessarily in sexual health issues and gynecologists, believe it or not, in their residencies receive in the neighborhood of four to eight hours on sexual health. And urologists would be similar, family doctors would receive less information. So unless it's something that they've identified as an area of interest, um, they may or may not um, bring this up with you, but they should have the resources and the knowledge to be able to refer you to the appropriate person. So keep asking the questions. Big questions, will treatment affect sexual function? If so, in what way and for how long? These are questions I would ask your doctor, again, ideally before treatment starts. Any risk to my partner if I'm undergoing treatment? As I said, we think the risks are probably very theoretical and very minimal um, in terms of chemo exposure and radiation exposure. I know they tell you when you've got the seeds implant that you're not to be um, having sex, and if you do have sex and you happen to see in the ejaculate that there are little seeds, you're not to touch them. Take them with tweezers if you can. Um, uh, but again, we typically advise to not be having sex during the radiation itself. Um, I already mentioned the risks to, to you if you're having sex during treatment. Again, thought to be minimal. And fertility we talked about. Resources, um, don't type sex into a Google search unless you're ready to get some interesting websites. Um, <laughs> I would follow specific websites and I've included some here um, that um, I can certainly have uh, Stuart send on to you. Um, Canadian Cancer Society and American Cancer Society are great. They have really, really good information. Um, lots of great books, I've brought some with me. I'm happy to, to let you flip through them as well. This is the Canadian Cancer Society publication available via the computer. It comes up as a PDF um, and it's very comprehensive. The Harvard Medical School Prostate Knowledge website, awesome, awesome, awesome. They have lots of different um, uh, categories of questions that people ask um, commonly about prostate cancer and, and living with prostate cancer. Um, Johns Hopkins um, uh, Medical uh, Medicine. Um, uh, this is a this is their particular their their urological institute. They've got great information on uh, side effects of uh, prostate cancer treatment. Um, UCLA similarly has great information. Um, the Center for Intimacy After Cancer Therapy, another really good uh, site specifically pertaining to to intimacy after prostate cancer. Um, this one's more of a, uh, a layperson site in, in the sense that um, it, it's a blog called Frank Talk and they have really excellent information, again, not intended to replace medical information specifically, but um, they've got uh, some discussion forums and they're very frank and very uh, open about some of the issues that come up after treatment, um, particularly related to sexual function. So the big take home messages. It's common for changes in sexuality to occur after a diagnosis of prostate cancer for both the patient and the partner. 
Um, and I think the cha changes in libido, desire, erection, and ejaculation may occur, but there are a number of non-medical and medical interventions that may help to improve sexual function. And the, bit, the first place to start, talk to your partner, and then talk to your healthcare provider, provider to find out what options may exist for you. If something isn't working, try something else, because there are lots of different things. I know it's difficult if, if things aren't working, it's, it's easy to get discouraged, um, but I encourage you to try something, something else, because there are a, a number of different things that may work. And keep talking to your partner and to your healthcare provider. And thank you for your time. And I'll end with a cartoon that says, by any chance, have you been rubbing the Viagra on your head and swallowing the Rogaine? <laughs>
um, if it did expose the, the female vaginal tissues or the male, if, if it's a male partner, um, you know, that kind of thing. You'd want to be cautious about that. So no, I, a short answer, no, I haven't heard <laughs> yet. You never get the short answer with me. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll check though. Yep. I attend a conference in LA about the PRIC conference. There are a couple of uh, speech by a particular doctor. He claimed himself penis doctor or sexuality doctor. Okay. That's not my question. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but no, 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 okay. No, 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 that's not my question. You mentioned his my name. My question is, do we the same similar of medical practice in Canada and are they covered by the medical care? So, uh, practitioners who specialize in, yeah, yeah. We do have it, yeah. yes. So, yes, yes. So when I first came to Calgary, because in Edmonton I was part of a group of urologists and gynecologists and psychologists that all had an interest in treating sexual dysfunction, and when I came to Calgary, I didn't know because you could send a patient to any gynecologist or urologist or, or specialist, and he or may she may not, he or she may not have had any. Um, education or um, extra um, training on sexual medicine. So to me it was really important to figure out who those people were in Calgary to be able to send my patients to. So yes, there, there are specialists, urologists and gynecologists, psychologists and endocrinologists um, in Calgary who do have an interest in treating patients with sexual health issues. Um, it was in 2006 I, I founded the, with Jay Lee actually, the Southern Alberta Sexual Health Association or SASHA and we have meetings um, every couple months of, and it, the group has grown, it started with just a handful of us and, and it's, we've got 30 plus people in the membership now. Um, uh, social workers, psychologists, urologists, family docs, medical students, where we're trying to um, spread the word and educate people about the importance of assessing and intervening when the, these sexual health issues arise, because it's very, very common. And yes, there are treatments. To see the physician or to see a social worker or one of those specialists typically is covered if it's in the context of a hospital setting. Um, to see pelvic floor physiotherapists, some of them are private, so if you see them in their private office, they may um, bill your insurance company if you've got third-party insurance like, like Blue Cross, Manulife, that kind of thing. Uh, the drug treatments are not covered, as many of you may know, um, Cialis, Viagra, Levitra, those medications are usually not covered by any insurance plan and they can be expensive. Um, the other types of treatments, the injection therapy, I believe is, the implantable, um, uh, the penile implant surgery is covered by Alberta Health, but the ancillary costs, the things like um, the, the Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and that kind of thing, and for women, the lubricants and different things like that, not covered. So there is an out-of-pocket out of cost for sure. I didn't mention, and I'll mention before I get <laughs> booted out, um, we talked with the women a little bit about the use of um, vibrators and that kind of thing. I meant to mention in this talk, there's some evidence to show as well that vibrators can actually help men too and you can use the vibrating function on various different settings to stimulate the penis. Um, um, you can place it next to the penis, you can place it on the penis, whatever's comfortable, but vibrators can be used and enjoyed by both, um, both partners in, in a relationship. It's just something to try out and play with and I'm happy to pass those around if people want to, they've never been used by anybody before, they're brand new. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. I've got one question of the, of the group and it's going to be just a poll of the men first of all. all. I'm going to assume that all of you are survivors. So you either have a urologist, a radiation oncologist, or a medical oncologist. How many of you have had a discussion about the impact of your treatment on your sexual function and sexuality. So it's I'm not zero. Sure. I'm glad it's, it's not, not zero. zero. But it's not the majority. No, no. Yeah. And, and and I could probably guess who you've seen. Yeah. Um, now, how did you? I guess my next question would be, how did you? Uh, did you access further resources that were over at the Tom Baker Center? Did you access? more resources? None. Or can I ask one then too, and it's a bit self-serving, but how many of you would access the clinic, partners or patients alike, if there was a sexual health clinic at the Tom Baker Cancer Center? Would that be something that would interest 
interest you? Even if you didn't want to attend, what did it interest you? Most of them are about work tomorrow. Like before then, I was not aware of the association I mm -hmm. think, or we had. So we basically were on I talked with John, uh, Dr. John Robbins. Robin, yeah. John, John's connected. He's also part of Sasha. Yeah. yeah. Also, the results, the results, she's on the southwest side. Life Mark, and then Life Mark, something like that. Life Mark, physio? Yeah. So, folks, within the library, we do have at least two books uh, that deal with this subject matter. And there's uh, another couple that uh, I know that we had books of that were indicated on your slides here. These. Um, that have gone out the door, so they're, they're borrowed. So, anyway, you can borrow these. Yeah, this Saving Your Sex Life was written by John Mulhall at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in uh, New York. This one just came out, and, and this is actually a, um, a friend of mine, Glenda. She had um, um, a type of bone cancer, and she had her her leg amputated many years she ago. But she did, yeah. Her husband had prostate cancer, um, so he, they've written a book. She's she wrote. Gone Whoops! Oh shoot! Look what I've done. <laughs> Broken the mouse. Uh, Lauren and John, I'm sure, will talk about this one: androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, and this is one that they just published last year. Um, and then there is Man Cancer Sex, written by Ann Katz. She works in the prostate cancer group in Winnipeg um, with Cancer Care Manitoba. There's a version for females as well. Um, and this is also pertaining to female sexual health. But yeah, and, and we're working on things in the provincial sexual health program um, on developing some resources for patients and healthcare providers alike, ways to renew and, and maintain um, physical intimacy and, and libido and that kind of thing too. So. So, I'm going to cut you off. Yep. I'm thank you very much.